Welcome to Lab 3. Let's talk about what this lab is about. We'll go through these leading examples, and we'll see if we can make sense of, of how we're going to be proceeding through all this stuff. So this lab is going to be on a combination of some Taylor series stuff and also some of the uh, parametric and polar plots. Uh, we're not going to do too much with any of the calculus with parametric curves or polar curves in this lab, but we will take a look at some of the plots and get a feel for how we can kind of visualize some of these. So again, We'll look at some Taylor series and then graphs of these other kinds of curves. First, we'll import our faithful packages, uh, NumPy, Matplotlib, we're good to go there. And let's take a look at this Taylor series example. So we're gonna be looking at this function, 2x cosine of x squared. And we talked through a little bit about how we can build the Taylor series for that. Hopefully we're comfortable with building that uh, without actually just building it by hand like, taking this f of x and differentiating it a whole bunch of times, which is going to be really annoying because there's going to be some product rule and some chain rule. Uh, and then from there, you know, evaluating at the center, which we could pick as zero, and then uh, dividing by factorial, seeing if we can come up with a pattern and build a series. It might just be easier to take the cosine series or the sine series and do some stuff to it. We know those two. And so here's what we'll get. You can go through this to just double check the fact that you know how to construct these series, but this should go pretty well. From here, what I'm going to do in this example is to just take a look and see if this series actually does converge to 2x cosine x squared. So we want to take a look and see, do these actually match up? The easiest way to do that is to just visualize these. So I'm going to define two functions. Here's 2x cosine x squared, and then this, oh my goodness, this is awful. Don't worry, you don't have to know anything about what's going on here. What this is going to do, though, is it's going to build our Taylor series. That's this thing here. You can kind of follow through. There's our negative 1 to the k times 2 x raised to the 4k plus 1 over, there's a factorial, right? This is 2k factorial. So hey, that looks like this. And what we're going to do is just build some partial sums of this thing. So I'm just going to run this. You're not going to have to recreate this f Taylor function. Here's a little explanation of what this is going to do. And what we can start doing is comparing our function at points. So what we're going to do is print the actual value of f of pi over 8. That is the actual value of 2x cosine of x squared. I think that's what it was. Was that our function? Yeah, 2x cosine of x squared evaluated at pi over 8. And then we'll just evaluate the Taylor series with two terms. So this is like a partial sum of the Taylor series. It's a Taylor polynomial at that same point. And we'll compare the outputs. And we can say, hey, look at these. They are pretty close to each other. They start deviating from each other right here, right? So, I mean, wow, that's, that's incredible. And then we can say, well, that's only with two terms. Let's go ahead and take a look at 20 terms. Whoa, these are almost bang on, right? Look, they don't deviate from each other until this last digit. That's incredible. I mean, for, for our purposes, these are essentially identical. Um, we're, we're not really going to run into many situations where this minute difference is going to really actually impact anything. So then what we might want to do is visualize the whole thing. So instead of just comparing it at one specific value, pi over 8, because that's relatively close to the center, let's just take a look at everything in this interval from like negative 4 to 4. I'm pretty sure I just picked this because it was a nice easy thing to plot where we could still see a bunch of details. So I'm going to build a list of x values, and I'm going to plot those x values with my actual function, and then also those x values with my Taylor polynomial. And uh, what we're going to notice then is that this, oh boy, this only looks like one curve. Wait a second, what's going on here? Hmm. Well, what this actually is is two curves. Uh, this is two curves, but you just can't really see what's happening. So what we want to do is just change the graph a little bit. Because these curves are so on top of each other, we can't see the blue one. So. I'm going to go ahead and uh, plot a horizontal line and some vertical lines for some axes just to make this thing look a little bit better. Uh, and then I'm also going to go ahead and plot this function. This is changing the line width and the transparency. So what you're going to see, there we go. We can see that this really is two curves just stacked on top of each other. And they are essentially the same thing on this interval from negative 4 to 4. Now, we might care about saying like, hey, what about a bigger interval of convergence, right? What if we change our x values from like negative 10 up to 10 here, and we run this? It's going to take a little bit longer, and you can see there's some weird stuff happening. 
right at the ends. This looks like just a straight line and then it just kind of fires off. What you'll notice is that this scale is actually really, really big. And that's because with these like 20 terms, I think we had it um, set up, uh, with these terms that we have, this Taylor function does deviate eventually right here at negative 10. And when it deviates, it deviates really fast. It goes really far away, and so it blows up the scale of this. So you could play with this and say, like, well, what about, like, negative 9 to 9? And try that. And you can say, okay, it's still deviating. Maybe, like, negative 8. We can kind of look back here. You'll see this scale is changing. This is times 10 to the 33rd power. Maybe I'll, I'll do 7s and see here. There's still some deviation, but you can see this scale is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can see why I picked negative 4 to 4. This is going to be a nice one that actually shows that, hey, these things are bang on equal to each other. So you can play with that a little bit. Feel free to tinker with some of that stuff, but whatever. Um, we've got 50 terms. Is that right? Let me see. This F Taylor function, I think I set it up where if we leave it blank, yep. Yeah, if we leave that second argument blank, it has 50 terms. So here we said two terms, here we said 20. If we don't say anything, it does 50. So this is with 50 terms in our partial sum. We could keep adding more terms here, but you're going to notice that as you do those kinds of things, it'll take longer computationally for us to do this. Um, so it would take some time to actually code it. It would take some time for the code to run. And then we also have like just limitations on the storage size of our memory because this is going to be saving a whole bunch of points. All this computer science mumble jumbo that we don't really care about in this class. All we care about is getting pretty pictures like this and saying, wow, look, these curves match up. These things must be the same up to our own little limitations. So hopefully that's convincing to see that these Taylor series, or at least this one, is actually representing the function that we want. We talk about intervals of convergences, and here we're visualizing that. We're saying, yes, this Taylor series looks like it's converging to this function on this interval here. Uh, and in theory, this one actually does go to negative infinity, positive infinity. We just have to use an infinite number of terms. Obviously, we can't program that, but we can see good evidence of it right here. So that's pretty cool. Let's move on and do some parametric stuff. This is not going to be too big of a deal. Running these parametric things isn't too bad. I don't think I actually need this bit of code here. I probably had that in because I wasn't running stuff at the very beginning. So let me just get rid of that. Uh, let's think about the, the core idea behind these. Instead of using, using an input x, we're using an input t. So you're going to notice I'm going to set up a list of t values. And now here we go. I have two functions, x and y. And the easy thing is I can just plot my x values that now aren't a list of inputs, it's a function evaluated at my list of inputs with my y values. So let me just go ahead and run this thing. And hey, there's my parametric plot. You can see in this title, I've got the ominous, or is it? What are we missing? Well, movement, right? A parametric plot is all about moving along a curve, and we don't have any way of visualizing that right now. There are some cool tools in Python where you can animate these plots, where you can actually see it moving along our curve, and that's not super easy to do, and it's really not easy to do in the Google Colab uh, environment, and so I just skipped doing that. What we can do instead is just add in some arrows. So I'm going to give us some plot arrow code that we can add in here, uh, and it's going to be kind of clunky a little bit, but I'll just give it to you for the most part where you can go ahead and just copy, paste, run these things in here, and bang. We've got an arrow showing movement, only one. If we wanted, we could add more. We could try and be a little bit more uh, detailed about this to really show off that movement because that's a, a key and important part of a parametric plot. Parametric plots are best visualized as animations, but if we're drawing it by hand ourselves or if we're plotting it in Python where we don't want to dig into all the animation code, then arrows will work. So make sure that we're including those as well. Polar curves are a little bit trickier, but there is this nice plot polar function that will help. And then there's a different version of this that we can use when we need it. So I'm going to do this weird function, 4 theta times the absolute value of sine theta between 0 and 4 pi. We're going to define our function. I'm going to call it r of t 
where T is going to stand for theta here. That's just to remind me that this is one of my polar functions. We don't have to. You could call this whatever you want and make the input variable whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Then instead of a list of x values, I'm going to give a list of theta values. I could call this t vals or theta vals or just theta. It doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you want. And again, I'm going to build that in the same way I would normally. I'm going to go from 0 up to 4 times pi, count by point 0 once. Everything's fine. And then we'll plot our list of inputs with our list of outputs using this polar function. And we'll add a title and show it. And look at that. It just kind of does it automatically for us. That's beautiful, right? There are tons of options where you can go in and tinker with the picture that they have. You can change it to be in terms of radian uh, instead of degrees. You can change where the like radius tick marks are. Here they're counting out by tens. You can do all that kind of customization. But in general, most of the time, the basics, the standards, the default settings are going to work for us. There's one weird thing, though. Let's plot a circle, and I'll show you the weird thing. Uh, this polar function, I, it took me a while to figure out what was wrong here. But when we plot just a basic circle, r sine theta, we know this, what this is going to look like from our notes, right? from our lecture videos. We know that this is going to be a circle centered up one unit with a radius of one. right? And wait a second, that's not. So more like polar trash, right? And it took me a bit to figure out what was going on until I noticed these radius tick marks. There's negatives on here. So one of the really strange things is that they don't, as a default, this polar function does not, as a default, make the center at the actual pole 0, 0 with a, a radius of 0. So we're going to have to just hard code that in. So I, I give a little bit of explanation in here, and I give the little bit of detail on how to do that. You're going to notice now we're going to go back to just our regular plot function because we're going to build in these specific axes that say polar here and this one we're setting our r limits to start at zero and in this case we're going to end at one because our circle has a radius of one and wow look at that it's a circle we could change this outer radius here and now we're going to have some extra space beyond our circle i could change this to like negative 10 and we're going to have a weird looking thing right but that's because see our radius here are counting down into the negatives so just to fix that i'm going to use this when we need to and I'll maybe go ahead and put that at like 1.2 might be nice. Hey, there we go. We can see our circle. And you can see it's counting out by 0.2s now out to 1.2. Nice. That looks good. Okay. Now, and I don't think I need that function here either. I've got this S of T function defined twice. I don't need that. Let me get rid of that. Okay, there we go. Now I'll let you go ahead and do it. So run this bit of code. And now let's just walk through the tasks that you're going to do. You're going to build this function, and we're going to build the Taylor series for it. You can hopefully do that. Take some hints from the notes that we have. Take a little bit of time to scrabble that down. If you want to check your answer, just ask. That's fine. But go ahead and first define the function g of x, just like we normally would. And then here it says, hey, we're going to build this g Taylor function. So go ahead and do that. Stop reading the lab. The answers are down here, right? So whatever. But I want you to go through the process. And if you get stuck on something, just ask me, right? This is me giving you a chance to study. I built that G Taylor function like we did earlier, right? So you won't have to do that. But now we're just going to go ahead and compare these things. Take a look at some different intervals of convergences. Use some different LW length or line weight, or maybe it's line width, I forget, options to change the thickness of those lines, like we did above, to see if you can get a nice looking graph where we can see where these functions are the same and where they might differ a little bit. And I wanted to look at these two intervals specifically. So here you should have two different plots with two different intervals on here. You can call them like x vals 1 and x vals 2, or you can just redefine x vals after the first plot, whatever you'd like. And I want you to notice that there's going to be something happening from negative one to one that didn't happen from negative three quarters to three quarters. And I want you to figure out what that is and just comment on it. Um, give me a little bit of discussion. And then we can talk about intervals of convergence and figure out what's going on from there. Then this something, this problem is not in the examples. Uh, so this is kind of a new thing. And I think it's really cool. This is one of my favorite lab problems. What I want you to do is compare the area, this integral from zero to three of sine x squared using Riemann sums and Taylor series. For the Riemann sum stuff, you might have to go back to the very first lab when we looked at areas and just remind yourself, or I guess it's lab one, 
not lab zero, right? The first lab is lab zero, whatever. Go back to the one where we looked at areas between curves and see if you can build a ream on sum. This part shouldn't be too hard where we just approximate the area with 15 rectangles, we're gonna say. Sure, no problem. That's gonna be a ream on sum area. But then what I wanna do is compare that area to the area that we might get from building a Taylor series of sine of x squared and anti-differentiating that and using the fundamental theorem of calculus. The issue here is that we can't find an antiderivative directly of sine of x squared because it's one of those functions that does not have an elementary antiderivative. So here's all this work that you can follow along of building a Taylor series representation of this integral. Bang, it's right here. This Taylor series, the series from zero up to eight of negative one to the k, three to the four k plus three over four k plus three times two k plus one factorial. Ugh, what a mouthful. That represents this integral. And what we can do is approximate this using a partial sum. So I'm going to give you the function here to build these Taylor terms. That's this thing here. And then we're just going to go ahead and look at a partial sum. Um, there's a thing here that I tell you we're going to have to use this d-type float here um, when we build our list of inputs for these Taylor terms, your x files or whatever you want to call them. Um, your, your indices or, or something like that. And that's just because the factorials and the exponentials get really, really big, and we need to really fix the memory type in Python, uh, specifically in the NP arrange function, so that it knows how to store these really big numbers. No big deal, but the factorials and the exponentials will screw up otherwise. So use this here for your list of inputs and just build a partial sum like you did earlier. And then here, what we're gonna notice is that we can use, because this is an alternating series, we can use the remainder theorem from our alternating series stuff to get a bound, an error bound, on our answer. So we're gonna say, hey, this partial sum is an approximation of this area, but we can get an error bound right here that says, okay, here's our approximation, but the real answer is you know, in between these two things, right? It's only this far away from our approximation, or our approximation is like, this close, right? And what we can do then is we can get an actual interval of values that will tell us exactly where that area is, the real honest area, not an approximation of it. It's going to say, hey, we're in between these things. And then we can go ahead and compare our Taylor series answer with our Riemann sum answer and see which one is better. So here's your question. Go ahead and use the remainder theorem to, to build those bounds and, and then do the comparison. Then we've got some kind of fun... Um, parametric curves. Here I give you some code for the arrow points that you can just copy and paste when you're building your curves here. That should add some arrows. This is going to be a nice cool plot. It's going to take probably a little bit of time to, to find these functions because they're kind of clunky. So to find them and double check them, make sure that you're actually writing things out correctly because it's easy, excuse me, to, to make a little mistake there. Same thing with this one. Here's a nice parametric curve. This one, again, is pretty clunky, but see if you can build it nicely. When you do these sine squares and cosine squares, you're going to have to write that like, you won't be able to do NP sine squared um, of, uh, what is it, like negative 5t, right? What you'll have to do is say sine of negative 5 times t, and then you'll have to square that whole thing. So the exponent will go on the outside of it. Or you can wrap this whole thing up in parentheses and square. And same thing for the cosine function there. So just keep an eye on that. And hey, comment on the plots. They're going to be pretty cool. Here's some neat polar ones. Again, figure out those exponents on here. I give you the code to set up for the nice fixing the polar axes stuff. And then make sure that you use the plot function, not the polar function on this one. And we should get some pretty cool curves. Then all I want you to do is to comment on those curves and then comment on the labs in general from this summer. Hopefully, this is a pretty good walkthrough of this last lab. What I've found is that the, the plotting section of this lab uh, won't be too hard. Um, there might be some little nuance with the code that we'll have to tinker with. It might be easy to make some typos on the uh, functions that you define. So there might be still some errors that show up there. But in general, the really hard thinking stuff is going to be with the Taylor series ones. So really make sure that you dedicate some time to go over those, figure out what's happening, and just ask questions if you've got them. Drop your screenshots in the Discord channel. Uh, send me some notes. I can talk about these during the office hour streams, all that normal stuff. That's all I've got for this. 
If you've been watching these intro videos, thank you so much. Hopefully they've been helpful, and I look forward to reading through these labs. These are always fun to grade, so thank you so much for, for watching all these, and good luck with this very last lab in our calculus class.